So hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Wangoi Mwangi. I'm a Kenyan registered nurse practicing right here in Kenya while trained here. So if you're new to this channel, please take your time to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload a new video. But if you're a returning subscriber, know that I deeply, deeply appreciate you. So today's topic is hypertension and this video is meant for nursing education as well as patient teaching and health education. I promise I have used a simplified language uh, away from medical jargon as possible. So stay tuned and let's learn together. So according to the American Heart Association, high blood pressure is defined as a blood pressure of above 140 over 90 or greater. 140 is the systolic blood pressure while the 90 is the diastolic blood pressure. Blood pressure is the pressure exerted on the artery walls uh, by the circulating blood. So simply that is what we are talking about. And pressure, according bl high blood pressure, according to the American Heart Association, is anything above 140 over 90. So there are different considerations I made while thinking about a topic to cover, and I thought hypertension would be among the best topics to cover. One, because it's an important medical and public health issue, since a lot of people are diagnosed with hypertension in their lifetime. Another important thing to note is that it is more common in the African uh, ethnicities or in the people of African descent, like us, like me. Uh, therefore, we have a lot more people in Africa and those who of African descent getting hypertension. Worldwide, again, we have about a billion people being affected by hypertension, and that's a lot of people. Then there's also a known direct link or relationship between hypertension and, hyper and cardiovascular disease. So yes, uh, you could start with just hypertension, but then end up with other severe illnesses or chronic illnesses uh, such as cardiovascular diseases and then there's also a proportional risk for heart attack heart failure stroke diabetes mellitus and renal disease with higher blood pressure therefore guys we need to have this in mind and if possible modify our lifestyle our living situations and take actionable points or steps to ensure that we are staying away from high blood pressure. So in the, for the physiology of high blood pressure, usually the, pump, the heart is pumping harder than it usually does because the blood vessels have thinned. And when I talk about blood vessels, I mean the arteries because these are the vessels that take blood away from the heart. So the heart is actually pumping blood out through the arteries. The veins are usually for bringing back blood from the other body parts to the heart so basically when you talk about the thinning blood vessels here we're talking about the arteries because that is what is affected by or that affects the blood pressure and the thinner the blood vessels if they get thinner than they usually were then it is like it is going to help ensure that the heart pumps harder and that means higher blood pressure for example just like the way if you're watering things using a hose pipe you know, like the way you close or you can press and minimize the size of the, the diameter of the lumen or the of the pipe, uh, the water tends to jet out. That is exactly what happens in high blood pressure. So when it comes to the pathophysiology of hypertension, there are very many factors. It is multifactorial and very complex because there are multiple factors that modulate the blood pressure in the body and this includes the hormone mediators, vascular reactivity, circulating blood volume, vascular caliber, blood viscosity, cardiac output, blood vessel elasticity, as well as the neurostimulation. So there are different factors that may play a, lot, play a role in having high blood pressure. But when someone has high blood pressure, this increased force makes the work the heart work harder to pump the blood to the body this increased force will put a strain on both the heart and the blood vessels if the force of the blood flow is high for some time eventually the tissue that make up the walls of the arteries will get stretched beyond the health limit so this overstretching of the blood vessels will make them more prone to rupture Damages to the vessels result in development of 
atherosclerosis, that is hardening of arteries, resulting into even higher blood pressure. So when we're discussing the stages and the types of hypertension, there could be a number of classifications. However, I have chosen the simplest way to actually describe this because we know most of the uh, vitals or the vital signs in the body uh, exist in a normal range. Uh, but anything that will be above 139 out of one of 89 will be prehypertension because in, pre in the stage of prehypertension, uh, this is not where this is a stage where someone has not been told they have hypertension yet, so probably they are not on medication. But they are being watched out, they are being watched out vigilantly to ensure that they do not develop hypertension. And if they do, then they are put on treatment. So, in this stage, someone's BP will be ranging uh, the upper one will be between 120 and 139 millimeters of mercury, and the diastolic one or the bottom one will be between 80 and 89 millimeters of mercury. So, at this stage, we do not have yet hypertension, but it is a stage that is approaching hypertension. So, we are beyond the normal. So, this is an elevation, this is just elevation. Then we have hypertension stage 1, and this is where the systolic blood pressure will be between 140 and 159 millimeters of mercury, and the bottom one of the systolic of the diastolic one will be between 90 and 99 millimeters of mercury. So at some point in uh, hypertension stage 1, your physician uh, handling your case or the person who is actually monitoring you may choose not to put you on treatment at this stage. They might even require you to just modify a few of your lifestyle choices and just modify your life. Uh, but some, in some cases, you might be put on treatment, especially if there is target organ uh, affect, uh, some target organs are affected and they're starting to fail, then you will be put on treatment. Then we have hypertension stage 2, and this is where we have systolic blood pressure more or equal to 160 millimeters of mercury, and the diastolic blood pressure more or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury. So definitely, definitely at this stage, you will be on treatment, and this is usually a lifelong treatment. Uh, there could be hope of you getting out of this treatment, but most of the time it is started in a way to help control this blood pressure within normal ranges to prevent the target organs from getting damaged from the increased blood pressure. Then we have another type, and this one occurs in women who are expecting or gravid women, and this is pregnancy-induced hypertension. Uh, this can be quite scary and quite um, dangerous. Uh, and it can complicate a pregnancy, but yes, um, our able uh, gynecologists and obstetricians actually handle this very well. Uh, at times, we may even require to have a physician following you specifically for this type of hypertension to prevent preeclampsia or eclampsia. So this is a classification table by medscape.com. That is where I retrieved that table. It is not from my head. And I thought it is quite a good table tabulating the clear classifications of hypertension. And you can see normal is between 120, the systolic, or below 120 and below, as well as diastolic of 80 and below. Prehypertension, again, as I had said earlier, is between 129 to 139 in systolic blood pressure, and while the diastolic will be between 80 and 89. Then stage 1 hypertension will be between 140 and 159, while the diastolic will be between 90 and 89. And then stage 2 hypertension will be between 100, over 160 millimeters of mercury systolic blood pressure and diastolic of above 100. Then we have hypertensive emergencies, and this is where the systolic is above 180 and the diastolic is above 120. And usually in hypertensive emergencies, the patient will be admitted for inpatient care to ensure that the pressure is controlled before they can be discharged. So the risk factors for hypertension include smoking, being overweight or obese, lack of physical exercise or activity, too much salt in the diet, too much alcohol consumption and this will go for anyone who drinks more than two drinks per day then stress older age genetics and hormonal concept contraceptives among others so there are several other risk factors i thought of mentioning just but a few uh, and if you look at all these risk factors 
there's something you can do if you have some of these risk factors there's something you can do apart from genetics and probably age the rest you can actually try to modify and lead a healthier lifestyle to ensure you stay away from hypertension so yes uh, different studies uh, have been shown have shown smoking to be one of the causative factors of hypertension uh, as well as weight uh, having uh, an unhealthy weight range it is important to maintain a wealthy a healthy weight for your height however this is a constant struggle for most people including myself and therefore if there's something you can do to shed a few pounds please do so that you're able to stay away from high blood pressure too much salt in diet this one we can try to adjust as much as possible and this means eating less processed food uh, so preparing your meals at home ensuring that you do not add table salt to your food once you serve um, doing as much as possible to stay away from salt because what happens with salt salt or sodium they cause more water retention and this again will increase the blood volume and an increased blood volume results in a high blood pressure so uh, stress old age and genetics these are things we may not have so much control over because stressful factors may come but again, you manage it as best as you can. Old age basically is maintaining a healthy lifestyle as you age. Uh, the more active you are as you age, the better your chances of not getting hypertension. Genetics, this one again, you can't do much about it because it's how you are born and to where you are born. Uh, people of, of African descent tend to get high blood pressure more than uh, people of Caucasian and Asian descent. So when it comes to the causes, I didn't go to the specific one by one cause. I just generalized it based on the systematic activity in the body and the functions of different body parts. Uh, but basically when the sympathetic nervous system activity has increased, most likely the blood pressure will increase because of the dysfunction in the autonomic nervous system. So basically if you have a normal sympathetic nervous system or autonomic nervous system, your blood pressure will be in normal range. But if there's a dysfunction in this system, again, you will get high blood pressure. When it comes to the kidney and the reabsorption in the kidney, if it is increased, if there's an increased reabsorption of sodium chloride and water because of genetic variation, again, this could result to high blood pressure. Because remember, when there is more sodium chloride, then a lot more water will be retained in the body and this will increase the blood volume and when the blood volume is increased then there will be a higher blood pressure than usual because there is a lot of volume to be flown or to flow through the blood vessels. Then when you talk about a kidney again there is something called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, the RAS, and the RAS basically does uh, retain water and sodium in the body system and this will increase to the expansion of the extracellular fluid volume when there is increased extracellular fluid volume there will be increased systemic vascular resistance again resulting in higher blood pressure uh, then we have decreased vasodilation of the arterioles the vascular and the endothelium in this case will be damaged and again, this will result to vasodilation of the arterioles and increased blood pressure. So usually, hypertension is known as a silent killer because it is asymptomatic, meaning it has no symptoms. Basically, the only time you'll get symptoms is if there is severe damage or if the hypertension is severe or there is damage to some end organs. So, but when there are some symptoms, they include fatigue, reduced activity tolerance, dizziness, palpitations, angina or chest pain, as well as difficulty in breathing. I have had many people complain of headaches when their blood pressure is raised, and that is also another symptom. Uh, there could be different, different uh, signs and symptoms of high blood pressure, although most of the time there will be not assist there will be no symptom not unless there is damage to other organs so basically there are very many investigation a person, a person with hypertension can be asked to do 
and this includes urinalysis to check the level of sodium concentration in urine to know how much sodium is being retained and how much is being lost and this can be an indicator of why the blood pressure is rising blood chemistry and this may be a test like um, ure uh, urea creatinines and other electrolytes uecs basically and uh, it depends on the values as well then there can be ECG or EKG depending on where you come from and this will be to rule out the presence of cardiovascular changes or damage. Then echocardiogram and this is to assess the presence of ventricular hypertrophy and this is very very important because an echocardiogram will give the ejection uh, rate from the heart or the cardiac ejection rate and if it is between 55 and 70 that is a good or within normal ejection rate but if it's below 55 there could be severe damage and ventricular hypertrophy then there's clear creatinine clearance and this again will be performed to check for the level of the burn uh, and will determine if there is renal damage or not or there's damage to the kidneys or not then renin levels uh, and this should be assessed to determine how the renin angiotestin and aldosterone system is coping with the system in the body or with the blood pressure. Then we have hemoglobin stroke hematocrit and this is not for diagnosis basically but to assess the relationship of cells to the fluid volume because sometimes when more water is retained in the body there will be just a lot of dilute blood. So such would be either cause hypercoagulability or anemia, so basically. Then there is burn or blood, urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. And this will again talk about or show how the kidneys are perfusing or are being uh, or even functioning. Then we have glucose and this is just to check if there is hyperglycemia so serum potassium is another test that could be done because hypokalemia may in indicate the presence of primary primary aldosteronism or a side effect of diuretic therapy so basically doing serum potassium is important serum calcium may show if there is imbalance then it, then it could lead to hypertension Lipid panels uh, to just show whether there is presence of atherosclerosis or thinning of blood vessels because the higher the lipids, then the thinner the, the blood vessels may be. Then there is thyroid studies because hyperthyroidism may lead or contribute to vasoconstriction and eventually leading to high blood pressure. Then we have a serum or urine aldosterone level to assess primary aldosteronism. This may cause increased blood pressure. Then we have creatinine clearance. We had talked about this, reflecting renal damage. Then uh, we have VMA, and this is a test uh, done on 24-hour urine and to assess if there is few more chromocytoma, which is another different uh, pathophysiology from this, but it could result to increased blood pressure. Uric acid may include a risk of having high blood pressure, especially if it is high or there is hyperuricemia, yes, that causes high blood pressure. If there is urine steroids, elevation may indicate hyperadrenalism, fear chromocytoma, pituitary dysfunction, and Cushing syndrome. All these conditions could result to high blood pressure. Then we have intravenous pyleurogram and in short it's called IVP and identify the cause of secondary hypertension. For example, if there is renal parenchymal disease or renal calculi or stones, kidney stones basically. Then we have kidney and renography uh, nuclear scan to evaluate the renal status basically, uh, how the kidneys are functioning. Then we have excretory urography to reveal renal atrophy, indicating chronic renal disease that may result from hypertension. Remember, a person may remain asymptomatic with high blood pressure until there is severe organ damage. So that is why some of these uh, tests are not even on the, on the heart. Basically, they will be on different organs to adjust ensure that everything is working optimally. Then a chest x-ray may be 
able to demonstrate obst obstructing calcification in valve areas. Uh, basically, it can help assess the heart for further damage because of high blood pressure. Then we have CT scan of different places uh, to assess if there is cerebral tumor that will be done in the head or there is a cerebrovascular accident or stroke or encephalopathy. So basically, uh, a CT scan of the brain will be done for that purpose. Preventative measures that one could take to avoid hypertension or to avoid getting hypertension include eating a healthy diet. Uh, this will help manage the blood pressure. A diet less of animal products or animal animal parts like eating beef, uh, whatever kinds of animal meat you're eating that may predispose you to hypertension. So if you choose more plant-based diet, diet with less salt, uh, less added salt, avoiding processed foods because you don't know how much salt they're putting in this, as well as over-the-counter medications because these could have a lot of sodium in them and remember sodium is equal to water retention to increase blood pressure. Then again, avoiding a sedentary lifestyle, getting active, having regular exercise. Even if you do not have so much you can do, you can even take a walk around the block, take the stairs instead of the elevator, just choose to be active, at least regularly, especially if you can do it daily, or at least thrice per week, this will help a lot in setting your cardiovascular in good shape. Then we have maintaining a healthy weight, wow, this is a big one, and it is a struggle for everyone or for most people. And it is possible because we have seen people do it. Uh, this we struggle with and we continue struggling until we do better in terms of weight. And then we have limiting alcohol intake. Then this is something you can actually do. It is good for your health as well as for your pocket because alcohol does not come free. It is quite expensive. So if you do limit the alcohol intake, then again you're staying away from high blood pressure, which is an added advantage. Then we have avoiding smoking, not smoking at all, this would help, especially if you're female because uh, there are more side effects of smoking in the female body than in the male body, according to some research that was done by somebody. I cannot, want, I do not want to quote them here because I'm paraphrasing, but I have read several studies that have shown more risk factors or more uh, disadvantages or demerits of smoking in women than in men, but basically, Smoking is not good for everyone, so avoid it if you can. Managing stress. There are many stressors in life, environmental, physical, and all that. But essentially, managing it as best as you can. So when it comes to the medical management, again, this has to do with the drugs that will be prescribed for a patient with high blood pressure. Depending on different treatment algorithm, I have summarized the most uh, effective uh, uh, blood pressure medication or high blood pressure medications. However, there are different other classes that I haven't included in this. This is a simplified version and uh, I use the acronym ABCD. And A is for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, S inhibitors like enalapril, lisinopril. That group is very, very effective in lowering the blood pressure, the high blood pressure. Then we have angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, and this will affect the RAS and will ensure that the angiotensin 1 is not converted in angiotensin 2. Sorry, that is for the first one, the ACE. The ACE will prevent angiotensin 1 from being converted into angiotensin 2. Uh, this meaning that the patient will not activate the RAS or the RAS will not be effective, meaning there will be no increased sodium or water retention. For angiotensin 2 receptor, blockers this is even though that had happened and you already have angiotensin 2 it will not be sensitive or it will not be able to be recognized and to stimulate the RAAS system then these ones include the losatans, candesatans, tenifistatan, valsatan then we have beta blockers like catenolol, propanolol these are very important because they lower the blood pressure Calcium channel blockers, nifedipine is the first generation or the first line in this. Then we have something like verapamil, diltiazem, amlodipine, nimodipine. There are different types of calcium channel blockers, but they are also important in controlling high blood pressure. Then we have diuretics, and they can either be potassium sparing diuretics, such as spironolactone, 
or spare potassium wasting diuretics like ferrosamide and hydrochlorothiazide. So basically, uh, diuretics are important because remember, sometimes high blood pressure will be as a result of increased blood volume, and this increased blood volume is because of increased water retention, in, uh, resulting in high volume of the blood. This requiring higher push by the, the by the pump, which is the heart, to increase the pressure to ensure that the patient is coping. But basically what that does is retain more water and result in even higher pressure. So basically, once you remove a lot of this water, the blood pressure will return to almost normal range. So when it comes to the pharmacologic management, it's the same as the medical management, but here we have a lot more classes of drugs that can be used for blood pressure or high blood pressure. And treatment varies depending on the age and the severity of the disease. But most often you'll find most of these drugs will be combined to ensure better results and to ensure that the patient's blood pressure is within a controllable range or within the normal range. So we have several other medications that I had not mentioned earlier. Medications, I mean classifications of antihypertensives such as alpha blockers, aldosterone antagonists, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, centrally acting diuretics, then we have renin inhibitors and vasodilators. So most of the time, if the patient is younger than 55 years, they may only require the A drugs. Uh, but then in step one, if they, we are talking about stage one, but then if you're in stage two, they will have to combine A plus C or A plus D. So there will be either uh, either one of the A's is either alpha blockers, aldosterone antagonists, and ACE inhibitors and ABS. So that could be combined with C or a calcium channel blocker. And that is why you'll see a patient maybe on losartan and nifedipine or um, esinopril or enaropril with, with uh, nifedipine or nimodipine or amlodipine. So basically that will be a, a combination. Then if the patient is uh, 55 years or older, and this is black patients basically of any age, uh, there will be C and D combined. C and D means a calcium channel blocker such as nifedipine, amlodipine, nimodipine, diltiazem, verapamil will be combined with a diuretic whether sparing calcium, uh, potassium or potassium wasting. Uh, then in step 3, there will be A plus C plus D. So yeah, this is kind of how the management works uh, but sometimes it is actually dependent on the physician managing the patient how they choose to combine those medications uh, but then in step four they will be having a plus c plus d plus either another alpha blocker or another beta blocker or consider referral if this is at a different or a smaller level of health management so thank you so much for staying tuned to this channel towards this end of this presentation on hypertension. Again, this is a very common condition in our general public. It is both a medical and public health menace. And if you can stay away from high blood pressure, please do. And remember, it is just the elevation of the blood pressure above 140 over 90. So if this happens to you, do not worry, just seek the best medication or the, me the best medical attention. And remember, I always advocate for positive health-seeking behavior because you deserve nothing but the best, but you're responsible for getting the best for you.